We're going to have a panel session now on the future of finance in Jersey. Should we start by introducing the panel? Probably easier if I tell you uh, who I am and what I do and what I don't do. Um, my name's Neil McCluskey. I'm the head of corporates for Barclays on Jersey. Um, I'm very much a generalist corporate banker um, looking after local Jersey businesses and, and also offshore corporates on the island. What I'm not is a technical expert, um, but what I have got is access to the teams that are in London, our technology specialist teams. Um, and we've also got involved in a, in a number of interesting, uh, innovative ways to help the digital community. Um, I'll perhaps pick up on that in the Q&A zone if it comes up rather than do a, a sales pitch now, um, but pick up on that in the questioning. Thanks, Andy. Jarrett, Digital Jersey, uh, director there. I think um, Neil, uh, high design or a bushel a bit, has been very um, helpful to me uh, in getting into Barclays in the UK, and he's also been very helpful to uh, tech businesses in Jersey, particularly startups struggling to get bank accounts. So I'll do the plug for you. If, um, easy for me to do it. Graham Foster. <laughs> With the kiosk. <laughs> Okay, so, okay I'll, I'll ask the first question and I think we'll pass it over to the audience. So the first question is, which areas of, of finance in Jersey do you think are going to move into fintech first? Did I mention that Tom Cowsill was here earlier? <laughs> um, he's run off. Um, that's the million dollar question. Uh, I think uh, some already have, so if you look at the things that are happening in the fund section in particular, uh, they're all doing some fairly exciting stuff with um, certainly machine learning, not sure that they're in the AI um, area yet. Um, I think the opportunity lays in the intersection of our reputation for um, privacy and uh, confidentiality um, with the data work, uh, uh, the, the sort of data analytics stuff, and applying that to the depth of skill uh, that the finance uh, guys have and uh, you know tonight and, and really this um, joining you guys he's trying to help that that romance really between the the finance and the the technical uh, area Neil as I said I'm not a te technological expert um, and I all str struggle with what the definition of fintech is um, which seems to be extremely wide-ranging um, and therefore, I think anything that's obviously improving the efficiencies of financial services and products gets bundled into that in many ways. Um, I think in Jersey, I mean, from a, for, from a banking perspective, um, there's a fair amount of peer-to-peer -peer lending going on and there's a fair amount of, uh, I don't know if there's any crowdfunding yet, but certainly peer-to-peer -peer lending, and they must need uh, or use uh, fintech uh, products uh, in some shape or, or fashion. Um, I don't know yet, and as a traditional banker, we, we tend not to get uh, asked for funding at the early stage, but it is a bit of a plug now. Um, we, we did launch a product in the UK about six months ago for technology businesses, something which is very, very new um, in the, for a traditional banker like me, in that these technology businesses don't have to have uh, EBITDA um, to approach us for lending facility. It's all about the, the, the worth of the business and having a VC uh, funds in the business, so it's just got to have an enterprise value um, and lending up to about five million. So I guess the banks are there to be supportive of it. I don't know where the demand's going to come from, but we're already having to be innovative to think about how we can cope with those businesses when they come to, to approach us. So um, yeah, I don't know which ones are going to be first, but we're, we're gearing ourselves up to, to assist. And that's Series B, is it? It is. Okay, so can we, do we have a question from the audience for the panel? Uh, so um, in the UK we're seeing a change to the way uh, banking licenses are being uh, thought of and issued, Atom Bank being the main one back in June. Essentially it's a, an app, but it's receiving a full banking license. Do you think Jersey is going to have to change its um, approaches on issuing banking licenses, historically being the top 500 in the world, will only get one. Do you think we're going to have to look at that to encourage uh, innovations around digital banking? 
I believe, and there's probably people way more qualified than me to answer this, but I believe they already are. So the top 500 uh, as such has, has gone or is, or is going, and there's different uh, metrics in. Yeah, I, I do understand um, from representatives of uh, JBA uh, and other organisations that it's widening up now. It's about what are they bringing to the island rather than where they are ranked. So it's understanding the business. So I think that is already beginning to change. Uh, for, from my perspective, the, the virtual banks we, we class them as need a touch point. So uh, globally, um, country specific, uh, it's a great opportunity for our business to provide them with a delivery mechanism and a touch point, not only for applications, but also to deliver you know, the, the, the bank branch solution when they're online. So um, we're getting some traction with those now. So uh, I, I welcome it. Just, you know, more of those, the better for us. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ed Daubney, um, what's the view on uh, cyber security um, and, and where do you see the opportunities uh, here in Jersey? And I'm going to talk to you because you're obviously well wired into what's going on in the global environment and, and where do you see the opportunities globally in cyber security? Because I see that as a big issue. Okay, question for me. He's... he's, he's uh, Jumped me. Okay, the, the the big things that are happening in cybersecurity, primarily at the moment, are around authentic, authentication, identity authentication. You'll know this, and ML KYC, because most of this thing's a little unusual in that it can do the KYC here and now, which is you have a specialist piece of equipment in there. The but there are lots and lots of authentication systems at the moment which are coming out. There's a massive scrap going on really between lots and lots of people vying for a very very large scalable solution that will become ubiquitous. So identity, authentication are really, really key. And then KYC, AML, linked up to all the databases you, that Graham talked about. Those are really, that's really the fighting ground, that, that the ground that everyone is really attacking at the moment. So we're not, it's not been cracked yet. There are lots of piecemeal solutions. It's a patchwork quilt, and most of the market isn't yet subscribed on that. But it'll be really interesting to see who actually cracks that problem and who gets it. And then there will be probably a kind of standard, I guess an open standard or whatever, that everybody will use at some point. At the moment, there are lots of proprietary solutions vying for that space. That's how I see it. I think um, there's a real opportunity for Jersey in the, in the cyber area um, to position itself as a secure place to do business. And that's um, the thread of the uh, working group that um, I kicked off a week or so ago with a number of people. Um, and I think if we can get um, a level uh, that the companies in the, certainly the financial services area, uh, adhere to perhaps some badge system, bronze, silver, gold, whatever, uh, and they help their suppliers also raise that. As a jurisdiction, we can be uh, known, or the vision would be, not only are we uh, a good place for uh, the traditional reasons of being private um, and, uh, and secure, but also from a technological standpoint as well. Interesting... Uh First question. Uh, so um, we're sort of going back to the, the classic dilemma of are you trying to add fin to tech or tech to fin? Um, and I think it's important that we, we don't go too far down that road because, Neil, as you said, I mean, your business is a fintech business and has been for 20 years. And probably what we need to be sure is that we're creating an, an environment where something in the middle. Uh, which none of us, well, maybe a few of us around the room, well, I shouldn't say us, a few of other people around the room, are developing, which fits into neither category. So it's neither a, a traditional business, be it a fund admin business looking to do something better, or a tech business with a great idea but doesn't know where to go. So my question really is, what, other, uh, what can we do to make Jersey the place for that type of idea to come to um, and not have to think as though it needs to be fin or tech, but just to exist? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put it another way. Uh, uh, you, you'll, be, well, you'll be familiar with the, um, the FCA Project Innovate uh, website. So if you're, a, if you're a fin or a tech or just a guy of an idea in the world at the moment and you Google, where can I go and talk to someone who would talk to me about how to regulate 
something like this and ha will it work? That's where you'll go to. So is that something Jersey should, should be doing? Should we be reaching out to other people and saying, look, if you've got ideas, come here, talk to us, uh, and we'll see whether or not we can embed you into our existing financial services or uh, digital ecosystem or build something around it, which I think is, is the point about Atom Bank. It's not the things we know, it's the things we don't know. Just project event I'll just deal with very quickly. The FCA, I, I dealt with the FCA on this quite some time ago. They, there was an issue with entrepreneurs getting access to the regulator to have discussions, to have what-if discussions about regulation. If you call the FCA today and you call the call centre, they can only answer questions on current re regulation, current uh, authorisation right now. If you ask them a question, what if I did this, they're not able to tell you. So Project Innovate is a way for entrepreneurs to access the FCA at roundtables, whatever. It's free. They don't need to hire compliance consultants or lawyers or whatever. So that's what Project Innovate is. They get their really best people around the table, and we've done it with them, and it's great because they bring their internal people. It's Chatham House rules, and you get a chance to say, what if I wanted to do this, what would happen? And they give you a nudge, which is great. In terms of fin or tech, Banks have had, I mean, I've been in banking, you know, working fintech in banking for 25 years or something. So banks have already, always had fintech. What's happened is not, is that there's been a massive increase in the amount of technologies hitting the world, in particularly smartphones, uh, you know, HTML5 and so on and so forth. That's what's really going on here. So it's not fin or tech. Banks have got fintech. They've had it for years. I've worked on it for years. What's happened is this very, very rapid disruption that's taking place as suddenly you've got millennials coming through who are fully, you know, fully off fait with smartphones. Kids have got, you know, you get a smartphone when you're born now. You know, you get smacked. You get given a smartphone. They cut the umbilical. You take a selfie. You post it on Facebook. <coughs> that's what's happening. It's that generation coming through. So it's this very, very rapid technology change that's coming through. So it's not, do we have fin or tech? We've always had fintech. It's the rapid acceleration that is taking everyone by surprise and allowing small companies to suddenly go global very, very quickly delivering financial services, where previously you could never have done that. So that, that hurdle has dropped. How do we get more of businesses like that business to come here? So our regulator, should our regulator be doing what... Right. So, so it can... Yeah, so, yes, so... The regulator environment really matters, and I'll give you some examples. So, um, yes, if you want to attract, so fintech is all about talent, because we don't, I mean, we have a laptop and we have nothing, you know, it's all in the cloud now. So you can set up a global fintech business with a laptop, because you'll put everything on Microsoft Azure or whatever. So that's easy. So it's all about people. This is not about physical equipment or capital equipment or whatever. So if you want to attract talent to Jersey, Regulation really matters, and a regulatory, a conducive regulatory environment really, really matters in terms of attracting talent. I'll give you an example. Standard Treasury is a Californian bank that is setting up in the UK to get a banking license in the UK because they gave up trying to get one in the US. So here's a Silicon Valley, here's a Californian bank who've raised money in the Valley who are now coming to London because the Treasury are welcoming new banks. You know, I hear figures of 28 to 30 banking licenses going through, and in the US, I think the last one issued was six years ago. So it, it does make a difference. So if you want to attract talent, regulatory environment really matters, ecosystem matters, other talent matters, you know, services and so on, hubs like this matter, that makes a difference. It's all about people, and if you wanted to create a cluster on an island somewhere, not Jersey, somewhere else, you know, Bikini Atoll or somewhere, what you do is you kidnap all the talent, you take them there, and you force them to live there. That's how you create a cluster. So anything that takes the talent will create that cluster. So yes, regulation really, really matters. And there are even examples of people leaving jurisdictions, not just the US, to, to, because of poor regulation. Another example, very quickly before I finish my long answer, is I know another company in Poland who, in Warsaw, because the Warsaw regulator really hasn't even got started on this, they go to London, set up a UK LTD, get regulated by the FCA, and then they passport back to their home country to practice. That's their way of getting regulated in Poland, so think about that too. So, that, so where there's a way, the entrepreneur will find the way, so you need to present it with a path of least resistance, and they'll follow that. And if that means moving to Jersey, they'll move to Jersey. And uh, the FinTech Working Group has identified that um, exactly, uh, that your point exactly is an issue and, and pushed that up to the, the steering group. So um, they're opining on that at the moment. But I, your, your point is very, very well made. I mean, it's happening 
a little bit unofficially um, now, but getting hold of somebody to give you an unofficial view from the uh, Financial Services Commission is, is, you know, is difficult. Um, but that you're 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 spot on with a requirement. I agree entirely. I'm um I am from the Guernsey regulator, so uh, I'm Gillian from <laughs> the Guernsey Financial Services Commission. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the beer. And uh, I just want to say, in Guernsey, we've done exactly this. So we've explicitly set up an equivalence project in the Vates. You can come and have early stage discussions. And if you want to talk more about you know, how that's working in Guernsey, happy to do so. Thank you. Hi, uh, Tom Castle, Jersey Finance. I should probably come in after the GFSC have, have been in. Um, I think Jason's point is very valid. Um, what I would say is that the Commission are open to, to talks, and we had, particularly on the CDD AML stuff, we had a business come to the Commission. Um, a couple of the guys from the GFSC came over as well, uh, sat down, talked through the product, and really tried to get their head around th things. So I wouldn't ever think that the door is shut at the Commission particularly at the higher level, I think if you can get the engagement, they're very open and they're very pro-business. Do you want to just, just move over here? So that, um, actually, I'm one of those guys from Guernsey GFSC that actually took part in that discussion. We did work with our colleagues in the Jersey Commission. We did meet with some of the businesses and we both took an open mind as to what can be developed and what should be developed for the Channel Islands, not just for individual competitive, friendly competitiveness. So I would support what the gentleman just said. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I agree en entirely. The, the, the competition is, is not Jersey Guernsey, it's, it's further afield and um, we should work more and more together. In fact, I was chatting to Chris uh, tonight uh, about sharing research into these, uh, you know, research that, that Jersey does is as relevant to Jersey as into, is into Guernsey for the part. So, and many businesses across Ireland. So, um, you know, why aren't we looking to potentially share some of that uh, research cost across both um, jurisdictions? Yeah, just, um, it's almost following on to some extent, but. Um, do we have a strategy to leverage the massive expertise we've got in the finance industry here in order to try and raise funds that would be available to uh, potential startups and uh, new tech businesses in the island? Because I can't see one at the moment in terms of involving the funds industry and you know, pulling people together. You know, do we actually have a strategy on it? From, uh, are you talking about um, seed funding? Um, yeah, or middle, str uh, middle level or even high level or development funding. So there's a number of things underway at the moment. There's the Jersey Innovation Fund, which um, does do uh, seed uh, level funding, um, but, but typically um, slightly bigger. Um, there is a new uh, group being formed. Am I okay to talk about this? Uh, no, yes, yes. Um, 49 North, which um, is, I guess, best described as um, uh, a dating agency, if, if you like. So that's there's people putting ideas into it, and then uh, uh, angels or people that want to invest uh, into that. Um, because of, um, and Jason will probably get the terminology, one of the JFSC people, right? The, you can't put a, a fund together because you get caught by the JFSC in a collective investment fund. So Ian's um, solution uh, is, is one uh, that would work uh, around that. And there's some others that are bumbling away in the background which I can't talk about yet. But that, that whole area is being addressed and there are some solutions uh, available today. So that's at a relatively lower level. We'll be talking second tier as well because that seems to be where, where there is a gap in the marketplace that there is you know, business that are already running that are well going and then to take that second gap. We've got the expertise here, surely, to be able to put, you know, expert funds together that would um, it attract that type of business into Jersey and start really putting us on the map. I'm just asking if there's a strategy there. That I'm aware of at the moment, there's nobody uh, putting together an expert fund for uh, investment in tech unless anybody in the audience knows to the contrary. Uh, possibly there is. Can I just say? Oh, can I just say one thing and pass it over to you? I don't think you necessarily need need a, need a local local fund anyway. In my experience, I mean, I know VCs who fly over from the US to the UK and everywhere, 
And you know, you know, so if you have the talent and the, and the startups here, trust me, they'll come and find you. I don't think you have to have, when UK government doesn't have a massive fund either. The point I was trying to make is we've got this massive, sorry. The point I was trying to make is we've got this massive expertise here in the industry, and I don't see it being particularly well leveraged into this area, but I may be wrong, and maybe I just am not aware of exactly what the requirements are. Okay, so uh, to comment on it, there is also, in addition to the working groups Andy talked about, there is a funding working group uh, with Digital Jersey, and its conclusion uh, sometime last year was the main gap is actually just after startup. And a number of people in this room are aware of the issues you've got there. The issue that we have here is that the Jersey tax system, which in the UK there is tax relief for any investor that wants to go into an early stage fund, that is not going to get any traction here in Jersey because the whole political move is 20 means 20%. So that's why there are now a number of alternative initiatives included and he talked about um, various clubs where we might be able to also get some leveraged funding into that stage. Once you get accelerate through that stage and you are then a growth company, it becomes relatively easy to do that. And your point is absolutely well made. A large number of the funds have connections to Jersey already. So Index Ventures, if you're in the VC fund, where's that administered from? In Jersey. Cambridge Innovation Capital Fund. Where is it actually administered from? It's administered from Jersey. So if there are Jersey businesses that are worthy of that level of capital investment, those funds are available. The problem is nobody really makes any profile out of it. Nobody really knows that that funding is channeled through Jersey. So I think there really is an opportunity to say, even if it isn't a Jersey company or it isn't even Jersey funds, funded via Jersey, funded through Jersey is something we need to make a lot more of. I agree. Hi, uh, Phil Godley, I'm CEO of SARN, um, which is a uh, local uh, fund and corporate service provider. Um, I can see why Graham and Atom would come to Jersey and would be attracted to Jersey for um, tax, business, commercial, infrastructure, flights, um, good um, you know, uh, IT infrastructure in terms of fibre and what have you. But, and, and, and Jersey would want to attract you for sure, so it's good growing business, you can attract finance, um, you will generate profits and, and, and that is good for the island. I can't see how then Jersey can attract the startups, the young guys, the, the entrepreneurs who don't have uh, local housing requirements, for example, um, who, come, who would want to come to Jersey because there is and inf you're developing an infrastructure, but personally, it would be very difficult for them. Is that being addressed in any way? So as a, as a, as a business which has had to attract people from outside of Jersey, um, we found it difficult as, as we've grown until we've got a better profile, until we've got a better profile with housing and the government, then we can attract people. But until then, it's very difficult. Well, ha having just come to the island three months ago, it is a, quite a difficult process to personally get in and get established. So um, that, that is quite painful, I have to say, and, and um, I think it could be a little bit easier. But the, the point that was being made there, if there was a fund here, there are, and you could advertise that, you know, to attract startups, entrepreneurs, techs, they, they'll come and they'll come. Uh, honestly, you know, I self-funded that business. I went to the UK Government Technology Strategy Board funding. You know, I, I've been through those processes and in the UK. Um, and, and that's pretty hard. Um, if, if you make it easy enough, then, then why wouldn't people want to come here from a business perspective? Because in the UK, you know, there, there's, there's tax and there's not here. So um, it's, it's a very attractive place to set up your, your HQ. Uh, for me, you know, I, I lived in Manchester for 15 years. I came here for the sun, but someone missed on with that one. Um, <laughs> so it, if you make it easy, if you, if you give everybody the tools that they need, then I'm sure that they'll come. And, and if you're looking to attract talent, um, if you make it easy, if you give them the funding that they require, they'll, they'll, they'll flock here because I come across people all the time. You know, it's a technology business that we're running. That they go, why are you in Jersey? And I explain the reasons and they go, how do I get there? You know, so you've just got to get it out there and, and, and advertise it and I think people will come. Um, so I understand that. I, I, so I was, uh, I'm from the UK and I came to Jersey when I was a graduate at university 
um, work with Jason back 20 years ago, and it was very difficult as an individual to um, find yeah. <laughs> to work with Jason. It was absolutely <laughs> that aside. Um, no, to, just to find a flat, just to um, housing qualifications is an issue. I mean, is that something you can work with the government yeah. to address? Yeah, there's there's two or three um, streams that Digital Jersey are uh, trying uh, to work towards to address those those issues. So there's a whole um, skills and education um, stream. There's a number of um, uh, projects that we're working on there with industry to help provide uh, the skills uh, that businesses need. You know, one one of the ones uh, last year was a coding program, um, and another one of the streams is around ecosystems. So, um, trying to get groups like this uh, off the ground, trying to get uh, development. There's uh, a project that we're uh, working on at the moment called iStart, which is um, an accelerator. We've worked with the population office and secured licenses. So that's around a, a couple of things. One around bringing entrepreneurial talent into the island to, to grow that gene pool, um, to, uh, to drive that through. Um, and to create more more business in that in that area, we're looking for funding for that as well. So, um, congratulations on your recent um, exit. And if you want to put some our way, um, you know, Paul Matterton will take checks, Bitcoin, anything that you want to put our way. Um, so we're trying. Yeah, we recognise it is um, absolutely uh, difficult at, at that end. Um, the success that we're having in the in the BD space, you quite rightly point out, is is much more in the uh, more mature. Uh, Process of a business. This you know, was a was a startup, but you know it was well funded and um, uh, well down the well down the pipe, uh, well down the pipeline. Can I just add one last point to that? I've we've worked with lots and lots of incubators and accelerators around the world, and they all recruit globally now because the fintechers will move will move. So the most recent one we worked with the fintech fusion in Switzerland, and they had about ninety applications to move to Switzerland for twelve months to run that program with Polytech Ventures. So as far as I can see, the fintechers will move. You know, and easy, I agree with Graham, if you make it easy, they'll move. But, but they, mo being mobile and global seems to be the norm because all the accelerators now recruit globally and they pay, you know, whatever it costs to do that because the fintechs, the, the early stage companies will move globally. So that doesn't seem to be an issue. Perhaps it's just a question of attraction, I don't know. Anyway, last question for the panel. Oh, do you want to comment on this? Uh, uh, so a couple of a couple of things. One is um, that in terms of uh, seed funding, um, one of the ventures is C5's FinTech Lab, and we've got a couple of the teams that we are working with at the moment uh, starting that up. So um, that's about bringing the technologists with the financial experts. And my question is, is mainly to yourself, is in uh, all of these startup jurisdictions, what do you find are the main components to actually get traction to bring the people with the ideas, in which we have a lot of here on the island in terms of uh, experience and talent in the finance industry, we've got phenomenal ability here, with the technicians, the technologists and entrepreneurs, how do you get that connection made, you know, connecting everybody up in the, in the, in, to make these things start and happen? It's actually quite a difficult question because it's a, qu it's a problem that all of the sort of incubators are trying to solve. And they all have a very standard kind of format, which is they, they, they recruit. So there's, there's, a, there's a slightly bigger picture here, which is you have, if you, if you bring existing finance together with tech fintechs, you tend to get evolution. Some people won't go anywhere near the existing guard because they want to disrupt. So the first thing you need to understand is there's a spectrum. So where you see a corporate program, it tends to produce evolution because you know, people don't go and work with Citibank if they want to disrupt Citibank. So there, there are different classes here of evolution, revolution, disruption taking place. So that's the higher context. Coming back to your question, which is really about the evolutionary side, I'm not, it, to be honest with you, it is never really done that well. It seems to be around experienced programs run by people like Techstars, who are just really good at this, have run this many, many times. It's about mentoring, choosing the right companies, bringing the right uh, mentors, getting the right connections into those companies and so on, and then creating the right sort of creative environment for those companies to flourish. If I really knew the answer, I could invest in all the really good early stage companies and make a fortune. Nobody really knows, but it's about maybe ticking all those boxes, making sure they have enough money to arrive, to land, they have a, you know, you've filtered them out, you've got the right support for them, you've got a really, really good program, and the best programs have taken probably several cycles, several years to get right. So I don't really, I'm not really sure anybody really knows the answer to that because there are so many of these programs now trying to produce 
trying to manufacture these fin successful fintechs, but it's very, very hard to do. And at the moment, I actually personally think the output is, is still fairly average. We're not seeing spectacular, we're not seeing Snapchats of finance. We're not seeing Ubers of finance. We're not seeing Airbnb, Airbnb of finance, not yet. So we're still quite evolutionary, and a lot of that is to do with people not it's still getting their head around. We're still quite locked into hundreds of years of thinking about finance, and you've really got to get some really disruptive stuff going to get people to totally deconstruct or whatever, and that's not really coming out of these programs yet. So I, I'm a fan of disruption because I think that's what will really make, bring massive change, and we're not really seeing that yet. So um, the answer is nobody really knows the answer to your question, I don't think, but there are some quite good practitioners in terms of you know, people like Techstars, Startup Bootcamp, who are quite experienced at running these programs, but it's very, very hard. So, <clears throat> sorry, I can't really, I can't tell you the magic formula. But it's, uh, I don't know, but I do, you know, I do know that it's about getting, it's about, we're not, we're still, we're not yet seeing serious thinking, serious deconstructed dis uh, disruption about financial services. And I don't mean to disrupt, it, disruption in the sense of destroying the old world. I mean in terms of creating brand new markets based on completely new tech. So look at, look at, look at uh, Uber or something, you know. Not an easy, why is that an easy target? Well, they're going to complain against that, but ultimately, you know, Uber is really doing disruptive things. It's shifting. In the finance industry, there is such an negative thing. No, no. It's, it's a good analogy, but I don't agree. Uber, right? Okay, forget Uber. Go back to calling a minicab. Have you ever tried it? You phone up, you get some mad woman who can't, and doesn't know where you are. You have to phone up to make sure your, your car's still coming. The guy's 20 minutes late. It's a nightmare. Okay, who's used Uber? Use Uber now. What they've done is they've taken that process, deconstructed it completely, reinvented it from scratch, and now I can see the guy coming. He's gonna, he helps me with my bag because he knows I need to rate him five star. I now get the best service ever from Uber, and I'm a massive Uber fan. It's the same guys driving the same cars. The difference is they've had... Uh, organization or structure process given to them through the app which tells them where to go and where and I rate them and they rate me that's been deconstructed completely it is not the electronic version of a minicab office so okay so here's another good analogy for you if you look at um, Christie's website look at look at Sotheby's website it is a digital version of an auction room if you look at look at eBay eBay is not the same it's a completely deconstructed rethought thing so eBay, which would you rather own? eBay turns over like 500 million, you know, billion quid a year. So eBay has deconstructed that, and that's disruption, right? At the moment, so, at, so what Uber did was really clever. They totally deconstructed that process, redesigned it from scratch, and gave you Uber. And if you use Uber, you know how superior it is to trying to call a minicab. Okay, we haven't seen that type of... De Airbnb have done the same thing with basically bed and breakfast. Okay, they didn't invent anything new. They didn't the finance old structures, regulations, yeah. controls, they use a sort of citizen police for money exchange. So there are, there's more barriers in finance and disruption. Yeah, I think, fi yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I think finance is more difficult, which is why finance has, has, so things like retail, Amazon, you know, retail, fashion, travel, all went. Those, those industries have, have been disrupted. We all use Expedia or whatever, right, don't we? We all use Amazon or whatever for retail. You use ASOS for fashion or whatever. So those industries went early because they were lower hanging fruit. And they were lower hanging fruit because they weren't heavily regulated. There are other industries like pharma or you know, airlines. You know, you know, finance is mission critical, not safety critical. Nobody dies when we get it wrong. So things like pharma and med tech are still back from where we are. So we're working on finance, which is, yes, much more difficult. But what's happened is that the tech has exhausted the gains in those other industries. So they've turned the guns on finance now because we're now, we're now the low-hanging fruit. This is the least difficult problem, and there are more difficult problems to come. So yeah, I agree. But what we're not seeing yet is the complete deconstruction and rethinking of some of these processes. Although you might argue that maybe crypto is a bit like that, blockchain's a bit like that. So there are some things that you're beginning to see which are quite disruptive, perhaps blockchain. Can I say something about that? Sure. Um, it seems to me that crypto, cryptocurrencies was the first really serious disruptive effort coming into fintech. And the bank's response to that 
uh, the traditional banks were to was to band together and use their PR machine to try and undermine it so so it doesn't get off the ground. Now there's a there's a goodly slug of the banking industry who are still in that camp. What makes you think that anything else seriously disruptive to the finance industry won't receive precisely the same reception from the traditional banking industry? You know, I'm quite sure that anything that threatens any industry, you know, if you've got a, mar a strategic market, you know, players defend their positions. I expect banks to defend their positions. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, f I personally know from, I believe, from looking at other industries that have been disrupted, that ultimately the tech wins. And the tech wins because it's overwhelming. And we've seen that time and time again. So in, if you look at e-commerce, retail, everything. I mean, media, if you look, old media and new media are a really good example. With old, old media, tried to refer to the internet as you know, a, a, a fad and all the rest of it and played it down. So we had the same, we've seen the same thing happen until online revenues matched, uh, exceeded offline revenues and everybody put their hands up and said it's all over. And now we have new media and we forget about old media. You know? And so, so that, that transition happens and part of that transition is the, is the existing incumbents protecting themselves, defending themselves, using PR and many other means against the new entrants and I think that's normal. Eddie. So, yeah. Eddie, an opportunity, um, I wonder, in sort of micropayments with the internet of things. Um, you know, as you know, Mark, Mark's saying, it, it's difficult to disrupt at the moment because of all those barriers. But actually, when your fridge starts talking to your car that starts talking to your... You, you, and then all of these payments start to happen without any human intervention because it's not needed anymore. Do you think that might actually be the catalyst for, for more uh, change? Yeah, I mean, if you look at what, what tends to happen out of what's happening right now, so for example, people say, what's the new bank going to look like? Okay, if you've got a chat app today, you can probably transfer money to other people with that chat app. You can receive money into your chat app without a bank account. So there's no bank involved. Because what do banks do? They store value, they transfer value, they exchange value. Well, my Bitcoin wallet does that, so, and my chat app does that. So there, there are lots of... There are lots of technology, basically, if there's a, a combinatorial way around the, the blockage, it finds its, its way, and that's basically what happens. So, Yeah, can I just quickly add something to that? I work for ASL in, um, in Africa. We're effectively, we're taking the banks out of the marketplace because uh, there's a lot of direct payment now using mobile phone credit, and, and that is likely to uh, continue uh, unabated. In, and in some ways, it may well be that Europe ends up being the, the country, the, the, and the West ends up being the uh, place that's behind the, the curve, and the cost of doing business here may be too expensive in the long run. But it's you know it's about it's a transition. This this is there will be you know this is a transformational this this technology hitting this industry um, challenges everybody. You know if you're an existing incumbent, you've got capital, you've got customers or whatever, but you're also entrenched. So you have a transformational issue. If you're a brand new startup, you have no capital, you have no customers, you start from zero. You know some of those are going to fail on both sides. Who knows what's the landscape going to look like when it's all settled? Probably make probably. Brilliant customers, brilliant financial services, lower cost, better value, blah, 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 through smartphones and all the rest of it. Probably the brands we know today but quite transformed, a bit like new media is. You know, you, you look at the FT site now, you look at, uh, look at The Economist, look at The Wall Street Journal, they have fantastic new media sites, but they used to be printed. And so some of these companies are going to transform and we're going to see them and some are going to go by the wayside. And I guess, you know, it's very, very difficult to predict because the, the tech boom, this tech, tech disruption is bigger than all of us can conceive, I think. It's beyond the wit of man to really plan out. So we try and guess at it, but we've seen it happen in other industries, and it creates these huge companies out of small ones, and who knows what. Neil, yeah. Eddie, yeah, I, I think you're right. There will be an immediate defensive reaction, won't there, from any industry when it's under attack from a competitor, um, and they're going to react in certain ways. I can only speak for Barclays, but one of the positive things I think we've done is join up with Techstars and do the Accelerator program. We're now in the third or fourth cohort, and we've actually just done a recent one in New York as well that we've just gone through a process. Um, and I see from some of the companies that we've taken onto the program, some of them are involved with Bitcoin. 
Now, clearly what Barclays is trying to do is position itself alongside some of those companies to see what they're doing, to work with them. We give them access, actually, to a lot of the bank's internal systems so that they can trial some of the things that they're doing. Yeah, we, we will be the next dinosaurs, we'll be the next industry to disappear if we don't work alongside the fintech community. So that's what we're trying to do to approach it, is to work alongside some of those businesses to see how we can survive uh, going, going forward. Yeah, it's just transformational. Your, your challenge is transformation, and the new guy's challenge is creation or getting off the ground. You know, it's, I think the tech challenges everyone. It, it challenges regulators too, and it challenges the consumer as well, who has to adopt all these new technologies. So when this hits, it's, it affects all of the stakeholders in the industry, not just those providing the services. I mean, there's a whole gap on consumer financial literacy. We're all building these fancy tech systems, you know, with or without banks, whatever. The consumers are miles behind. I spoke to a cab driver the other day who'd never heard of peer-to-peer -peer lending. He was really amazed that people could lend to each other. And I said, have you heard of Zopa 20, 2005? It's like 10 years old. He's like, no, can you really lend to other people? You know, so maybe 99% of the population don't know what we're talking about. You know, so there's other stakeholders like consumers, businesses who have no idea about the working capital platforms, all that type of stuff happening. So this is a 10 year, 20 year haul. And you know, anyone's guess what's gonna happen. So, so your, your answer, long answer to your question, your, I can't see you, there's a plant in the way. Behind the behind, you're behind the foliage. Is, is, yeah, people defend their positions in lots of different ways. But basically, I, I, but bear in mind with, with crypto, there've been, there's lots of issues around AML and whatever. But as those things become regulated, as, as the UK Gov's looking at now, as Jersey's looking at now, you'll then find them go mainstream because blockchain and crypto is quite compelling as a value proposition. I've heard it said that in the long run, the banks see themselves as guardians of reputation rather than value. And I, I just wonder how, how far down that, that track the traditional banks will go. It's a question of who trusts who, because it's it's not that easy to tr to trust you know fresh startups with your your life savings, is it? No, but the startups get that, which is why that if they're FSA regulated, you might think differently. If they have a banking license, you might think differently because it's government bank. You know, you might think differently. Depends who they are. Yeah, sure. If it's Mt. Gox, yeah, absolutely not. But then, if you don't know what Mt. Gox is, it was a Japanese um, Bitcoin um, company that went, but well, basically ran off with everybody's money. It was an exchange that ran off with everyone's money. But well, I, I met, a, I was talking to the government about this, and I said, well, if you're going to put your £10 notes in envelopes and post them to some guy in Japan you don't know to hold on to for you, then that's your fault, right? You know, this was an unregulated exchange in some far-off company country, and people sent them their valuable bitcoins. And then one day, the, the guy disappeared. You know, and nobody knew what happened, and all the money went. And that's Bitcoin's fault. Well, it's not. It's you're stupid. You know, I mean, you know, if you're going to start posting your valuables to people in other jurisdictions, then what do you expect to happen? So, but if you if you posted them to that person, um, having had and establish banks say so that that person is trustworthy, that's a different issue. Yeah, you might do that. So what I'm saying is that it's been suggested that <coughs> there is a place in the future for the traditional banks to provide that assurance rather than necessarily the, the mechanics of actually dealing with the value. Quite possibly. Quite possibly. Can I ask a really short question which isn't of the panel? I was going to ask Phil a question. This Phil. So you're the COO of a relatively large business, large in Jersey terms, uh, fairly typical in terms of its uh, diversity. Uh, do you have problems, for want of a better word, uh, or um, uh, issues in your business that technology could, could solve, you think? where you don't know what the answer is? Yes. How many times has anyone asked you what those problems are? We only ask ourselves. And so going back to where I started, uh, we're still at Finn and we're at Tech, and you know, it's great that you're here, and, I don't, and it's great that people from the, the GFSC are here, but most of the people in the room are from the Tech yep. side, and we need to get more of the Finn involved. 
Otherwise, those problems never get surfaced. Yeah. And the bright guys around the room never think, well, actually, I can solve that problem for Phil. And that's where I think this, this should lead. So getting more people like you here. So, um, you know, we, as a business, um, take an interest in digital jersey, kind of on the sidelines. Um, we want to talk to you guys more. We know that the only business which is related to financial services, which is sponsored digital jersey, is OJA, their law firm. So there's no fund administrators, no corporate service providers. KPMG. <laughs> 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 um, who, who, who can sponsor digital jersey, but yet every single one sponsors JFL. Um, and you're creating that bridge, but I think that's not enough. I think digital jersey has to get much closer to the finance industry to help us solve those questions, which there's only us asking ourselves at the moment. I, I would suggest, however, that. Uh on the spectrum of people who could sign checks for significant fintech developments, I would suggest that you are more towards the youthful end of that spectrum. I would say so. <laughs> well, I, 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 I would imagine there's quite a lot of people who would have a lot of trouble getting their heads around the, the technological end of it, sufficient to sign a major check. Yeah. For such a development. It's so, not so just Phil's business though, it's the bridge Phil's business has into other businesses yeah. as well. So it's listed the clients and no. so here's, here's some stats. So um someone is about three hundred people. Um it's primarily a people business. So okay, we've got general ledgers, we've got payment systems, we've got fund administration systems which we try and integrate through that value chain. We've got a valuation of three hundred million, that's a million pounds per person. So there's a lot riding at stake in terms of how we provide that service. So it's not can we afford it, it's you know, if, if we get disrupted, then you know, it's the end of that business. Guys, one thing I've learned from this is we need to maybe talk about this bridge more as a function of this group. That's yeah, it's as we were talking earlier. Yeah. I call it romance. Romance. You call it the romance. So we need to create the romance more. But I, I personally just think that will come out of this continuous sort of process of, of engaging with people. It's still fairly new here, isn't it? So um, yeah. So okay. So do you mind if we should we move on, or do you want to keep? We can keep on it. But I think move we should on. probably move on. Okay, move on. Right. Well, thank you very much, guys. If you'd like to take a seat, I'll just close up here. It's probably the most engaged panel I think I've seen for a long time. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.